Okay, on this Resetter TV, I interviewed Todd White. He is the founder of Dry Farm Wines. So those of you that are looking to find a way to drink wine that doesn't destroy your health, you are gonna wanna hear this interview. And stay tuned through the whole thing because he goes through the science and the, and the history of wine and why Dry Farm Wines is the healthiest wine to drink. So really cool info, excited to share it with you, enjoy. So I am really excited to bring to you not only one of my favorite people that I love talking to, but he has one of my favorite products that has made keto and fasting just, I, I don't want to say a more enjoyable experience, but your company has made it so that we can really enjoy a fasting lifestyle and drink our wine as well. So let me start off by welcoming Todd White. Thank you so much for being here. Mindy, you know, I'm a huge fan. Thank I you. can't see you often enough. Just before this recording, in fact, I was in a conference call with Mark, and he's like, and we had a conflict in the meeting. He's like, what is going on? I was like, oh, I have to record with Dr. Mindy. And he's like, oh, she's so awesome. So, <laughs> so we were talking about you. It was a great time. So anyway, I'm super yeah, excited you. to be here and lots to talk about, including some of the deep, dirty, dark secrets of the wine industry. Yes, please, because prior to meeting you, we were, I mean, I, I still have a cellar full of Silver Oak and a lot of Napa Valley wines that I'm just not sure what to do with. And prior to meeting you, I thought if I'm going to step into the keto lifestyle, if I'm going to try to be the healthiest possible, I had to give up wine. And you really taught me otherwise. And so I really want you to teach my, my resetters how that works. So let's start off by I, I think it's it would be nice to hear how you got into the natural wine business because that's an interesting story as well. I remember you telling it to me a, years, a couple of years back. Yeah, it was kind of all by accident. I did not intend to create a business out of this. It was never a business endeavor. It was really, I had become ketogenic about five years ago and I still largely live uh, a ketogenic lifestyle, what I would call more modified keto today as opposed to for many years I was actually therapeutic uh, diet, ketogenic therapeutic diet, which is a good bit more uh, constrained and a good bit more um, intense than the modified. A modified diet would be, I would describe a modified ketogenic diet as the Atkins program, right? Yeah. And, which is not therapeutic. But for a couple of years, I was therapeutic, uh, just experimenting with it. And uh, it can become quite boring. So, yeah. um, so that's the reason I tend to eat a little bit outside of the therapeutic Great. zone now, yep. uh, but have experimented all over the place. But I had become really committed to the ketogenic diet about five and a half years ago before it had actually become the thing that it is today. Yep. The only people who really knew about it then were some doctors, a few researchers in the biohacking community, which is how I learned about it. Even though I had been experimenting with the Atkins program since the 1980s, I always found that I performed better and were leaner on a lower carb diet. Absolutely. I just have a body type that doesn't respond well to carbohydrate. Yep. And particularly highly glycemic carbohydrates. Yep, totally. And agree. so, um, I mean, it's like really notable. Like sometimes if I travel, I can just be off program for one or two days and I notice a huge difference in inflammation and also just in my feel. Yes. So, um, and I'll hold water. Right. So anyway, but I had become very committed to a ketogenic lifestyle at the time. And I was a lifelong wine drinker. I've been drinking wine since I was nine years old and drinking a lot of wine. And I, after I became keto, I found that I couldn't drink wine anymore. It was making me feel terrible. I was having brain fog. I was reacting much more um, intensely and acutely to, to, to alcohol. Well, I didn't drink anything at the time other than wine. So I, I just... I really assumed at the time that it was because that wines had become so high in alcohol. So alcohol has been rising in wines for the last 30 years pretty steadily. 
And it surprises a lot of people to hear the wine guy say that alcohol is a da dangerous neurotoxin, right? And so I don't love alcohol, actually. I love wine. Right. And so, which is the reason that I only drink and sell lower alcohol wines. And we can talk about that a little bit later, yes. but, but which is really, really important. Agreed. Uh, alcohol is a really nasty drug. It's also addictive and it's what we call a domino drug. So meaning that like cocaine is a domino drug. So alcohol, the more you drink of it, the more you want to drink. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it kind of pulls you in. Yep. So it's best to start off with, a lower alcohol wine in the first place. And I don't drink spirits at all or any other kind of alcohol, but because I just really love wine. And so I wanted to continue to drink wine, feel great, feel better, be in keto, stay in keto and not have my wine affect any of that. So that's how it all kind of started. I wasn't even thinking of it as a business and I didn't know anything about natural wine at the time. And I'll talk about natural wine now for a moment, just because the term is very confusing to people. Agreed. Right. So when I say natural wine, people say, well, isn't all wine natural? And it's not for the reasons I'm about to explain to you. But back then, I didn't know anything about natural wine and natural wine and its revolution were just beginning about the same time in central France. And so I didn't, you know, the thing is, I, I just was trying to drink lower alcohol wine at the, at the time. I didn't know about all the other problems with wine. And the other problems with wine primarily is there's a couple of really dark secrets and a really kind of disturbing thing that's going on in the wine industry. By the way, everything I'm going to tell you here and share with your audience is easily verifiable with a simple Google search. Awesome. All the facts that I'm about to tell you is nothing here that is too arcane. It's just that nobody knows about it. Well, I've told a few million people now, but, <laughs> but before that, you know, nobody really knew about it. So, but here's where it begins. It begins, it might not surprise you with money and greed, right? And so it begins with the consolidation of the American wine industry. It's happening globally, but you know, Americans, we like to scale everything, mm -hmm. right? So we scale greed, we scale, we scale obesity, we scale everything. We make everything bigger, right? Right. So what happened in the American wine industry is that because of money and greed, these massive wine companies over the last 15, 20 years have been buying everything up. And so the wine industry today looks a lot like our food supply. It's controlled by just a handful of massive multinational conglomerates, right? Mm -hmm. And in the wine business, 50, the reason this is important is because it tells the whole story of what happens, right? Because right. it's all about money and greed. So what happened in the wine business today, 52% of all the wines manufactured in the United States are made by just three giant conglomerates. And the top 30 companies in the United States make over 70% of U.S. wines. Now, you don't know that mm -hmm. because when you go into the grocery store or a wine shop and you see hundreds and hundreds or a thousand different bottles there. See, what you don't know is that most of those were made by just a handful of companies. Interesting. Now, how they hide that from you, because they don't want you to know that, because they got a farmhouse on the label or a chateau. They want you to believe that you're drinking from some small farmhouse. In yeah. fact, what you're drinking is manufactured in massive factories in Central California and these wine factories. And these multi-billion dollar marketing conglomerates hide behind tens of thousands of labels and brands to confuse consumers, right? Interesting. So from there, then we get into the collusion between Washington, D.C., lobby money, and the wine industry. And here's how that acts out. There are 76 additives approved by the FDA for the use in winemaking. Four of them are quite toxic. Some of them are natural. The problem is that the wine industry has lobbied and spent money in Washington to keep contents labeling off of wine bottles. Yeah, which is crazy. I remember when you taught me that. That's crazy. Well, the reason they don't want a contents label on the wine bottle because they don't want you to really know what's in it. So that's where natural wine comes in. I'll come to that in a moment. But 
these 76 additives, one of them is so toxic, dimethyl dicarbonate, marketed under the brand name Valcarin. It is a treatment for wine. It treats, its use is to treat the most common bacterial fault in wine known as Brettamyces. But here's the toxicity level. If you, if you do a Wikipedia search for dimethyl dicarbonate, which if you go to the 76 additives allowed by the FDA by typing in FDA approved wine additives, you'll see dimethyl dicarbonate on the list. And if you go to Wikipedia and you search dimethyl dicarbonate, you'll find that under the section that says hazard from Wikipedia colon, it says toxic, right? And so this chemical, this dangerous chemical, was used to treat tens of millions of gallons of California wine. Now, here's how it's treated. I'm just giving you one. This is how it's treated. Specially licensed contractors come into the winery in hazmat suits, right? Hmm. They apply this chemical to the wine. They, if, 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 the, if the chemical were to come in contact with their skin or they would breathe it, it would cause lung damage or burn their skin, right? No one else can be in the winery for 24 hours within application at the time of application or 24 hours afterwards. And if you drank the wine within 24 hours, you would die, right? Wow. And so this is the kind of thing. Now, here's the problem. If you choose to drink dimethyl dicarbonate or glyphosate or anything else that's poisonous in wine, if you choose to drink that, I'm okay with that. I just think you should know that. Right. right. I think you should have the option to drink what you want and know what's in it. Same thing of any other kind of processed food that I would pick up. Anything that's not whole, raw, and real, I'm going to look at the contents label. Right. Because I want to know what's in it. I want to know if there's sugar in my peanut butter. Right. You know, I, I, I want to know what's in it. You don't have that option with wine. And this is mostly American wines? No, it's a, it's a global issue. They're not, there's not a contents label on wine anywhere in the world. But this chemical is most, is right now is mostly in American wines. That's correct. That's the one chemical, but there are, the EU has 56 approved additives. Uh, interesting. And then there's all kinds of additives in farming, right? We've got industrial farming. Why do we have industrial farming? Because it's cheaper, it's faster, it's more profitable, right? Yep. Why do we have irrigation? See, dry farm wines, as you know, is the name of our company. Our wines are not irrigated. Irrigation is bad for the planet, it's bad for the vine, and it's bad for your health, yep. right? So the, this, the, there's all, but what irrigation does do, and 99.9% .9 of American vineyards are irrigated. Why? Because it's more profitable. It creates a higher yield. Farming is cheaper. And the fruit weighs more. When you fill a berry with, with water, it might not surprise you that it weighs more. And guess what? Fruit sold by the ton, right? So this, this is, th these are all the issues that, that are going on. Let's talk about what a natural wine is. Again, confusing term. Natural wines are always organically grown or biodynamically grown. And biodynamic farming is a prescriptive form of organic farming. Yep. It's been around since the 1920s. So it's either organic or biodynamically farmed. In our case, it's irrigation free or dry farmed. Uh, it is then, this is a really important distinction, it is fermented utilizing wild native indigenous yeast that are indigenous to the vineyard where the grape is grown. So what does all that mean? Every grape berry, every wine grape berry in the world has yeast on the skin at the time of harvest. It's collected through the air, it's in the vineyard, it's indigenous, right? So when it's harvested, you have this yeast on the skin. Now the very first thing that a commercial winemaker does is kill that native yeast. And then they inoculate it with a genetically modified lab cultured and lab grown yeast. Now, why do they do that? It's easier, it's more profitable, it's less risky. Interesting. Native yeast are very temperamental. 
and you can't make wine in high volumes with it, right? It requires a lot of coddling. It's a wild yeast, right? It's not built to be sturdy. It's built to live in nature, right? right? And so, you, and you can't make wine in very high volumes utilizing it. So, this genetically modified lab-grown yeast is quite sturdy. The other problem with the native yeast, it won't withstand the high alcohol environment. Alcohol will kill it. Ah, uh, interesting. Right? And so, <clears throat> because in nature, alcohol never gets that high. Right. Meaning in nature, when the grape falls off of the vine and it hits the ground and it bursts open and the yeast comes in contact with the sugar, it's not in an environment where the, yeast, where the alcohol level can become very high. Right. Yep. And so it's not in this concentrated tank setting like you make wine in. So anyway, so the other, the other interesting thing about these modified yeast, I, I think kind of one of the most novel things about them is that you can buy them in flavor profiles. What's that well, mean? Well, interesting. what that means is if you, dr if you grow this industrial crappy grape in Central California, but you want to taste like it's from Italy on the Mediterranean coast, they have a yeast for that. Interesting. Right? And so, <laughs> so that, that's, and, and when, when you see these, if you pick up a wine supply magazine or you go to a wine tr supply trade show or you do uh, a search for wine supplies, wine making supplies online, you'll see these yeast and you'll see, you know, they come in little packages and you'll see them, um, you, you'll see that they, they specify that they'll withstand high alcohol environments. I mean, this is an advertising fact. Right. You know, or you'll see flavor profiles yeah. of, of different types of yeast. So anyway, natural wines always are instantaneous, ins what they call instantaneous fer fermentation. Because once the juice comes in contact with the existing yeast that hasn't been killed, right? Remember, Here's what the commercial winemaker does is dump sulfur dioxide into the tank to immediately kill the wild yeast because they don't want the wild yeast and the cultured yeast competing with one another. So kill the wild yeast, then they inoculate it with commercial yeast. And so the, what happens in natural winemaking is what's called an instantaneous fermentation because once the juice comes in contact with the yeast, it ferments. Mm. There's an instantaneous fermentation. Uh, as long as the temperature is warm enough. If the cellar is too cold, just like your grandmother used to put yeast up on top of the oven or the refrigerator where it was warm, you know, when making bread to get it to, to, to ferment, you know, to pop. Same thing in wine. Yeast won't activate. Yeast won't activate if the environment's too cold, right? Okay. So, so same, same kind of theory when you're making bread. Yeast just won't activate. Okay. So, so anyway, if it is warm enough, you'll have a, what's called a spontaneous fermentation. It will just begin fermenting immediately. And I was going to say, so you, but if you're putting it in your cellar where it's cold, then well, it's, you, you can raise this. You, you, well, if, if you're talking about a cave, then where, where you might be, where you might be aging wine, but in the cellar, typically in the cellar, you can, you control temperature in there. Right. It's not like underground usually. Right, okay. It, it's usually, it's not subterranean as a general rule. Okay. Uh, they're usually above ground and they okay. control the temperature in there. And people work in there all year round, right? In right. the winter time, people are working in there. And I mean, it's like, you know, so it's, right. not, it's not warm, but it's not cold either. Okay, right? so it still can activate the yeast. Yes, the yeast okay. will activate especially during the fermentation process, right? So if you're fermenting, if you're in there, you know, it's just a little warmer. Right, right. But, right. Um, so anyway, that, so native, uh, organic or biodynamic, native yeast fermentation, dry farming in our case, not all natural wines around the world are dry farmed, but ours are, and most are. Mm -hmm. It's not a universal rule, but most are. And then no additives, nothing in, nothing out of the wine, mm -hmm. right? And then, so the winemaking style is also very different. As you know, our wines are light and refreshing mm -hmm. and very elegant. Yep. And, you know, they're not what you associate with if you were to drink American wine, heavy, dark, you know, syrupy, you know, kind of like thicker, right? Yeah, That's the, a, 
they really have a different taste. And I mean that in a positive way, but you can taste the difference between your wines and the wines that are made the way you just explained. Yeah, it's really becomes evident once you start drinking more dry farm wines. Well, the other thing that you notice is that you can't go back to drinking those wines. No, again. <laughs> no, no, you, nor do you feel good. I mean, you don't other, feel good when you yeah. drink them. You didn't know before you were feeling right. so bad. That's right. Actually, one of the first things I ever heard you say that really I always think about when I have a glass of dry farm wine is that you said wine was meant to be, make you feel social and have good conversation and, and to kind of enjoy over a long meal. And that's what I actually love so much about your wines. Whereas if I go somewhere and I order a glass of wine that I don't really know what's, it, 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 what's behind it, like one, two glasses, like I'm tipsy. I don't feel social. I feel like I want to go to bed. Like it is not, it's, it's really a different high. I don't know another way it's to say that. It's a completely different high. The yeah. buzz is more energized. Yes. It's yeah. lighter. It's fresher. And yeah. part of that is lower alcohol, which we'll talk about in a moment. But it's also, it's not just the alcohol, it's the additives, it's the extractions, which is a winemaking style. Yep. It's also higher sugar byproducts like glycerol, right, which gives it mouthfeel and long finishes. You'll notice with dry farm wines, you don't have any long finishes, right, because that's, that's a winemaking style we believe makes you feel bad, ultimately, right? right? And so there's no science around any of this, but what I can tell you is if I drink a bottle of standard California red wine, and I drink a bottle of natural wine from us, there is a very distinct difference in how I feel, even from glass one, mm -hmm. even from right. sip two or three, I yeah. feel a heaviness on my head, I can feel my brain, it doesn't feel right when I drink that wine anymore. Yeah, right? agreed. Yeah. And, and people feel this way, but they don't really know that they feel bad, because they think this is what wine feels like. Right. Yeah. Right, and you, and and if you're a regular wine drinker like I am, and you know, and our mission is to really help regular wine drinkers because they're the ones who need the most help. And when I say regular wine drinker, I'm talking about somebody who drinks wine daily or nearly daily. I drink wine every single day, unless I'm in an extended water fast. Yep. Right. I only eat once per day, so I do 22 hour daily intermittent fast or time restricted eating is a more appropriate definition of it, but. People call it intermittent fasting, but I don't think a 22-hour fast is really a fast. I think it's time-restricted feeding, but Peter Atiyah talks a lot about this same concept. But, but on extended water fast, which I do typically about once a month or every six weeks for three to five days, I don't drink wine during that time. Other than that, I drink one plus bottles of wine every night, right? One or more. One you know, is good. I wanted, want you to talk about the health benefits of that. And, and I want to point one thing out because I hear this so much when I'm doing one-on-one -on -one consults with people. They say, I can no longer drink wine. It just doesn't work for me anymore. And what I really want to point out is everything that you talked about leading up to this, all those chemicals that are in there is what you're reacting to. When you hear Todd say, I drink a, a bottle and a half a day, there is a, it's a whole different benefit. There's a whole different health experience that's going on in the natural wine. And I think that's important for people to know. That is true. Look, we, so maybe I drink a little bit more than the average. It's, it's possible, but you also have to remember this. American wines are now averaging right almost 15% yeah. ABV, right? 15% alcohol by volume. The wines I drink are between 9 and 11%. Yep. Now, that doesn't sound like a big difference, but it's a massive difference. It's a 40% difference, yep. right? So just on the alcohol alone, forget winemaking styles, toxins, additives, just the alcohol alone, the bottle I'm drinking is 40% less alcohol, yeah. right? And so there are only three things in wine. I mean, unless it, other than the additives, but in natural wine, there are only three things, water, ethyl alcohol, and polyphenols and flavonoids, antiflavonoids are the compounds that, that we believe impart positive health benefits, which is why 
Most people will recommend drinking red wine over white wine for health benefits because the polyphenols are four times greater in red wine because those polyphenols come, the increase comes from contact with the skin and the seeds of red wine, which is how red wine gets its color and its tannic structure. It's tannin structures from the seed and the skin. It's also where it gets the increase in polyphenols, which in white wines are just over 200. And in red wine, there are between eight and 900 polyphenols. The most famous one you probably know is resveratrol. Yep. And so whether or not resveratrol is effective in humans, we don't know. There's no scientific proof of that. It has been shown in lab mice to, ex to extend lifespan, but there's no proof in humans. I'm still taking my chances and drinking a bottle of red wine a day, just in case. Yep. But so well, anyway. And and one other thought I just want to point out on that is that, you know, we've done thousands of tests on people's microbiome. We do a test called a gut zoomer. And I will tell you, like 99% of the time, people's gut issues are not coming from a pathogen like candida or a virus or E. coli or a parasite. They're coming because they don't have enough good bacteria. Right. So when you hear, when I hear you say polyphenols, I'm like, yes. So this is one of the places, if you're doing dry farm wine, you can add, get some polyphenols in to be able to feed your good bacteria. Right. And I think that's a really important way we can start to categorize some of these natural wines. The, the other thing that's happening in natural wine, and this is a very important distinction, and they, Dr. David Perlmutter has written twice about our wines and the gut-friendly bacteria that is still present in living wines. What is a living wine? Natural wines are living. Why are they living? And why do they contain these bacteria that commercial wines don't contain? Because commercial wines have been sterilized at the time of bottling with a heavy dose of sulfur dioxide. Mm -hmm. Sulfur dioxide not only stabilizes and preserves the wine, it also sterilizes it if the dose is high enough, right? And so what, what commercial wines wanna do is have this shelf dependent product, very stable, fully sterilized, what we call mummified and McDonaldized, right? And yeah. so they, they, they want every bottle to taste exactly the same. So natural wines aren't like that. Natural wines are still alive, they have spirit, right? And they have these living bacteria and they also won't age for a really long time either. Right? They're fine for a few years, but they, you're not going to hold a natural wine for 10 years right. Right? because it does, it's not been sterilized and preserved. Now, sulfur has been being used since the Romans to preserve wine. We don't have any specific issue with small amounts of sulfur. Historically, it's been done for thousands of years. The problem is the amount of sulfur, right? which, we, which is one of the things we do lab tests for. As you know, we lab test every wine. We use an independent certified enologist to lab test every wine that we sell. If it doesn't meet our strict standards of purity, then we will not accept the wine, even if it's natural. We reject many natural wines because they don't meet our particular standards. Doesn't mean that they're not safe, fun, and good. They don't meet our standards. Dry Farm Wines has standards over and above just being natural, right? right. right. Like alcohol, like sugar. Are we required that our wines are sugar free because I'm not into sugar because it takes yeah. me out of ketosis and I could go on a whole dark, dirty wormhole on why I think sugar is the most widely abused, addictive, toxic drug in America, yes. right? Or around the world for that matter. I spend a couple of hundred days a year traveling around Europe, you know, visiting farmers and that sugar is... You know, when you see these breakfast things and stuff in, in, in France or all across Europe, I mean, it's unbelievable. They're no different. And they don't look like we do. And they don't seem to suffer from some of the same chronic diseases we suffer from. But it's certainly not from a shortage of eating a fair amount of sugar. That's right. You know, but somehow they get away with it a little bit differently than Americans. And there's probably a whole lot of hypothesis for that. But so anyway... I think the most important thing, when we talk about the health benefits of wine, you know, there's a ton of studies out there. Look, there are as many studies that will tell you alcohol is 
not healthy for you. And for women, it can cause cancer. I mean, there, like you, there's, there, you, you'll find as many studies that it, alcohol is harmful for you as you will find that it extends lifespan, it extends lifespan that it improves cardiovascular health, that it improves neurological health. So there's studies on both sides of that argument. Yeah, yeah. You know, what it, you know what it reminds me a little bit about is the, is the China study. You know, and the, everybody quotes the China study as being why vegetarianism should be the healthiest way to, uh, for, for you to live. But what they don't realize is that in the China study, they never looked at the difference between commercial meats and organic grass-fed meats. So when you're looking at those studies showing the adverse effect of alcohol or specifically wine, what I, again, I want people to realize is that you, only, you have to separate out what the wines that Todd has and the, and the regular wines you're drinking at a restaurant. It's true. You know, the, the problem is you can't get a control group study. So we just yeah. don't know. This is the problem throughout nutrition. You know, you, you, you look at the blue zones and four of the five blue zones, wine is a daily staple of their diet. Yeah. right or moderate alcohol uh in in the case of okanagua but but um it's not a, but in the rest of the in crete and sardinia i mean the, wine is a daily staple of their diet now the five now we got the blue zones the five blue zones now they're under attack because it's mm -hmm. like well wait a second maybe there's not good birth keeping records in the blue zone so we don't know if this is real anymore either yeah so i mean here's the thing i'm a wine drinker i'm gonna drink wine I like it. I'm not going to stop. And so I, I don't, I'm not here to tell you that it's good or bad for you. I'm going to drink it. I like it. If you want to drink healthier, then I can help you do that. Right. right? I'm not going to stop drinking wine, you see, because I love it. Yeah. And if they, even if he came out tomorrow and said, you know, wine's going to take five years off your life or last 10 years, I still drink it. Right. Because I like it. Right. And so, but what I want to be able to do is make the best informed, educated choice. And whether you buy wine from me or not, doesn't matter. You should be buying natural wine or lower intervention wine. And you should be trying to find out who your drug dealer is. Right. And, and is so, there a way to see that? I mean, can, can no, you No, not, not, well, I give you a few hints on that, but, but you know, the, before we get to the hints on how to buy wine, if you don't get it from us and, you're only going to get, if, if you want, like, if you're a fanatic like I am, and you are. Yeah, I was going like, to say. This thing, you're only <laughs> going to drink our wine because. I am 100% committed to your wine. Right, well, I'm, I'm just saying because we're the only company that does what we do in terms of lab testing. And, and as you know, you've met all of us. We're super fanatical, like yep. health enthusiasts. And, you know, we're all ripped out. And we're just like, we're just into it, right? right? That's how we got in this business. And when you meet us you can see this is not marketing spend, like we walk the walk. Right, right, exactly. But before I get into kind of tips about how to buy healthier wine, assuming you're not getting it from us, I wanna talk for a minute about the real health benefit of wine. And the real health benefit of wine is that wine creates love, mm. right? And wine is natural wines, not the ones that have been sterilized. I'm talking about natural wines. Natural wines, have the living spirit of the farm in the bottle, it's still alive, right? And, and so, and wine is the only beverage, not the only, but let's say the only popular, the only widely distributed alcohol beverage where the farmer, this is the case in natural wine, uh, where the farmer is also the winemaker. So only one person puts their fingerprint from farming to your table. All is the spirit of one person. Right. Right. That's not true in spirits or beer or, or mass produced wines where they're all done through factories and big farming. But when you drink a small, all of, all of our wines are small family farms, right? Tiny. You can't make natural wine in great quantities. So when you drink this wine, you're really drinking the single spirit of this person who cradled this elixir from living soil to your glass, right? That's cool, right? Because cool. when you go to, when you go to a natural wine farm, so if you come to Napa Valley where I live, when you come here, you go into some fancy tasting room that some famous architect designed, right? And it's a yeah. fun experience, whatever. 
But when you go to a natural wine farm, there is no tasting room. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, I mean, if you taste, it'll be at the farmer's kitchen table or it'll be in his cellar. There's no tasting room like ever. And the very first thing when you get there, you don't taste wine. You don't even see any wine. The very first thing the farmer wants to do is take you to the vineyard. Yep. And true. talk about soil. All he wants yeah. to talk about is soil, right? And, 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 and biodiversity and animals on the farm. And, and what my, one of my favorite Italian farmers who doesn't speak English and, and doesn't pl plow his soil is like, you know, a natural wine, there's no, the, the vineyards are all, look like a jungle, right? They're, they're, they're not kept, they look like a wild place because that's nature. Right. And this, this old Italian farmer, he says, the plowing is by the little, the little animals in the soil. The little animals, he's talking about insects. Yeah. Right. And the reason that he doesn't plow and the reason that most natural farmers that we, that grow wine for us, don't plow is because there's this whole ecosystem below the earth, right? So when you expose that topsoil and turn it over in plowing, all of those millions of organisms die from the heat of the sun, right? And so they want all of that kept in the ground. Mm -hmm. So they have cover crops. And when you go to a natural wine vineyard, it looks like grass, like there's hardly there's hardly any space between the undergrowth and the vine itself. It looks like a jungle in there, right? Because they want to attract butterflies and insects and they want to protect that. Um, they want to protect the, the underlying soil, you know, the, the mulch, what they call mulch. Right. And the mulch helps lock in the moisture, right? So you've got the living matter at the top with the, the green that you can see. And then below that, you've got what they call mulch, right? Which is a natural decaying of the surface, right? right? And then below that, you have the soil. And the mulch locks, the mulch creates more decay. But in the meantime, it also locks in the mulch moisture that doesn't require you to irrigate. So are you getting more minerals, more uh, better back microbiome? Like well, the reason there? you're getting more minerals, in large part, the reason you're getting better microbiome and, and higher polyphenols in this is because you're not irrigating. See, right. an, irrigated, okay. an irrigated grapevine <clears throat> has a root structure that's about three feet in diameter and about three feet deep or about a meter deep, right? Because it gets all of its nutrient and all of its water from a little hose just above the trunk, where an unirrigated grapevine can have a root structure that can span 40 or 50 feet deep. Okay. As it's searching, struggling to find nutrients, struggling to find just little tiny hair-like capillaries searching for moisture, right, to feed the right. plant. That struggle creates a much higher minerality in the fruit, creates a much higher poly, polyphenol content and uh, is just better for the vine. The vine, doesn't, you know, the vine doesn't care a thing about making wine. See, the vine wants to make the most beautiful, precious, mm. charismatic fruit that the bird will choose their vine mm. over the next vine yeah. to propagate the seed. Yeah. Right? And so that's what the vine exists for, is only to have the bird eat its fruit. Right? And of course, the farmer's trying to keep the bird from eating the fruit. Yeah. So, so, you're get, so you're getting more minerals. You're getting, coming from when you're drinking natural wines, you're getting it from a, dry, from a more rich soil. So it comes all the living way Living soils yeah, that have not so been killed with industrial chemicals. That's amazing. Like glyphosate is the number one applied herbicide yeah. in U.S. vineyards. Glyphosate is commonly found, and we do regular testing for it, commonly found in California wines. Yeah. And it's thought really that it's coming through the irrigation because the way glyphosate or Roundup is applied in a vineyard, it's not applied at a high level like you would have in crop dusting, right? right. Or you would have from drones on, on wheat fields. Part of the problem with organic wheat, I don't eat wheat, don't recommend that you eat it, but if you do try to eat organic wheat, the problem is with the organic wheat is that the 
glyphosate Roundup is being applied from the air, right? Right. Down from the air. Either, yeah. either from drones or, or from planes. Yeah. And then it, it blows over a good ways over to neighboring organic farms. Great farming, glyphosate's not applied that way. It's applied very close to the ground, very close, like, you know, inches off the ground. There's not a lot of risk for overspray in that case, it's thought. It's thought that glyphosate is getting into organic wines. There's been a couple of studies that have shown a lot of glyphosate contamination in California wines in organic wines. And we'll talk about in a moment, organic versus natural. But so it's, it, the speculation now is that it's getting in the wine through the irrigation, which is not good for people like me who live in Napa Valley. And I'm drinking the same table water, the same uh, water table that, that the plants are getting their irrigation from. But let me address one thing here on the, um, on organic, because this is another question that we yeah, please do, because people will ask me that as well. Right. So they'll say, "Is organic wine better than non-organic wine?" Yes, to a point. So not all organic wines, most organic wines are not natural, but all natural wines are organic, right? And so let's say you go into Whole Foods and you see an organic wine as an example. The likelihood is that it's not natural and here's why. Because you can't make wine in high enough volumes naturally to supply someone like Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. Or even if it's biodynamic, there's a very large, very famous, very well advertised biodynamic farm in California that makes a lot of wine and a lot of wine for Whole Foods, right? But they're not natural. They are biodynamic. But then you have seller practices. So in order to be a natural wine, you have to have both biodynamic and organic farming plus natural seller practices. Mm. So, you know, be dubious of just because it says organic. Is organic better than non-organic industrial? For sure. But that's not the full story, there's more right? To it, yeah. And so since there's no international certification, now Dry Farm Wines has a certification, but there's no international certification for natural wine. And to many people, natural wine starts to sound dubious. It starts to sound something like sustainable farming, which is also BS, right? So when, when you see food products that say, oh, sustainably grown, well, what does that mean? right? Yeah, that means it's non-organic. Yeah. That means it's non-organic is what it means. And so yeah. sometimes I think it's easy to hear natural wine. And that's a little bit dubious because it's like, oh, what does that mean? It's just sustainable? Is it the same kind of thing? No. Natural wine has an international standard of understanding, but not a certification, right? right? Hopefully it'll get certified sometime soon, but you know, and there are people who are working on that, trying to create certification processes. Dry Farm Wines has an internal certification that we test and certify for. And that so, so talk a little bit about if people want, like, again, I'm, I'm going to just advocate for your company because it's been incredible being able to just commit 100%. In our household, our other resetters, my patients, like, once people just make that decision, I'm going 100% Dry Farm Wines. That, and using wines that have been tested, you just, you don't get hangovers. You, I mean, it's just the level of health that you can have along with drinking these wines is incredible. But let's say you don't have access to dry farm wines. Let's say you're at a restaurant. Like, are, are there some guidelines we can use? Yeah, so let me, let me touch on two things um, as, as we get to closing here. A, how to find natural wine. Now, natural wine is only going to be available in major markets. Uh, New York, San Francisco, Washington, Dallas, LA, um, maybe Denver, maybe. Um, so you're only going to find natural wines available anywhere in, in major markets. Now, if you're in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, you'll find natural wine retailers. They don't sell anything but natural wine. If it's a natural wine retailer, they're fanatics like we are. Now, that doesn't mean that they're lab tested, doesn't mean they're sugar free, doesn't mean they're not higher in alcohol. They don't have our same standards, but they are natural. And so then if 
there's also a smartphone app called Raisin, just like the dried grape. And that smartphone app, Raisin, you can download it on your phone. And it's a map-based search that will show you all of the, um, that will show you all of the natural wine retailers, bars, and restaurants that carry natural wines in your area, if there are okay. any. Okay. Right? And they're, you, like, they work really well in bigger cities. It works really well, well across Europe. Great. Right? Because most of the natural wines are in Europe. Yep. And so, um, and natural wine in Europe is a really, really big thing. And it's becoming a bigger thing here. So you can do that. Um, if, if you are, um, you can also do a Google search for natural wines okay. uh, in your area. And you might find some resources there. Maybe, maybe not. Depends on where you live. Um, and uh, if you're in a restaurant, you know, you're going to be generally better off to order wines from Europe, generally, and to order wines specifically, more generally, in central France, right? Central France, okay. Yeah, Beaujolais, yeah. Loire Valley, because in central France, you're, the, you're, the weather is cooler and so alcohol levels are more likely to be lower. So I look at, if I'm, even if I'm in a natural wine bar, I mean, I go to the best natural wine bars in the world, and they're all, except for New York, most of them are in Europe. And so you, you know, I will request, if I don't know the wines, I request them to bring out three or four, I believe will be lower in alcohol, or I ask them only bring me wines at 12 and a half percent or lower yep. in alcohol. So you go to too. the cellar, you figure it out, and you present yep. me the wines. Yep, I've done that. It works really well. Right. And then, so you can put them to work. Most of them look like they don't even, they think you're crazy, right? It's like, but, you know, I care about the alcohol I consume and I like drinking wine. I like drinking a lot of it. And so lower alcohol is also more likely to coincide with a lighter winemaking style, Yeah. right? Yeah. Even if it's not natural. So let's say you go in the grocery store and you find the French section and you start looking at the back of bottles and you find a bottle that's 12 and a half percent alcohol, even if it's not natural, the style is going to make you feel better. Yep. Just because this, you probably had this experience. Yep. Yep. You know, there's a there's a producer and that produces. I mean, there are commercial commercial Louis um, Louis um, Louis. Now the name escapes me. It's a big commercial producer in France, but they make a Pinot Noir uh, that's twelve and a half percent alcohol. It's commercial as hell. You can be sure. But you know what? I still feel better drinking it because it's lower in alcohol. And the style of making lower alcohol wines, whether they're natural or not, you'll just feel better. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, well, so we, we're going to create a link so that people can get your wines. And I would, I, you know, any advice for people when they first start drinking their wines, what I always tell them is it will have a different taste. And it's a very light kind of friendly wine. That's the way I, I look at it's it. Super food friendly, much more yeah. friendly to food. Yeah, much more. So there's a lot more water in it. You don't sit down and have a salad with vodka, right? <laughs> That's right. I mean, there's a lot more water in lower alcohol wines because remember, there's only three things in a natural wine: water, alcohol, and and polyphenol compounds. And so yeah. it's mostly water. If yeah. you're drinking 11% wine, you're drinking 91% water. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so, it's, so you, uh, and, and I have found that my taste buds have shifted now the more course, I drink it. So that's they understand. Will. Yeah. The first couple of times we drank it, we were, it's almost like we're, because it's a living thing, we're trying to figure out how does this fit for us. And then once we got a rhythm with it, it's just been so enjoyable. Well, you, I mean, you can't go back. No, you can't go which back. Which is like yeah. a great, you know, it's been a great blessing for my business. Right. Because you know, yeah. once you start drinking, you can't return to drinking. The, yeah. you, what you'll then when you go back and you drink that wine again the old wine you used to drink you're like uh yeah hey I, I, I feel bad yeah. B, i don't even like the taste of it yeah see it gives me a headache yeah you know i got brain fog when i wake up yeah it's like know, i don't sleep well same way yeah uh, yeah yeah so this was this has been awesome. I always love talking wine with you. I actually like drinking wine with you even better. Me so, too. 
I'm excited. I'll see you on Friday at Cal Jam and we'll drink some wine together. I'm looking forward to it. I love you. Thank you for calling thank today. You. Yeah. Thank talk you, to you, Todd. Have, talk have to a you soon. Day. Okay. Bye.